Good evening, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Thanks for coming along. There's uh, three things happening tonight. First thing is we're, we're going to uh, do a demonstration of this new piece of technology, the Cabo. Then I'm going to show some movies about some outback uh, experiences where Stein gear is put to the test. And then there's a short interval. And then three people are going to play, Richard Barrett, Corfell, and myself. And that's basically the program. So to start with, um, just an introduction to, to Barry Through, who's here from um, San Francisco. Um, yeah, how to put it. Well, many years ago, a long, long time ago, well, actually not, but 18, uh, no, sorry, 19, 1987, Stime actually probably made the first MIDI bow. There's, there's possibly some other people at MIT might disagree with that, but um, it was made here, and uh, it had ultrasound was the main controller, and then later this thing was developed and it got a, a pressure sensor, and then when accelerometers happened in the middle of the 90s, we got some of those. Back then, accelerometers cost like about 700 euro for one accelerometer. Now it's like 10 bucks for a game controller with three on or something. So the thing has developed. All of this was kind of interesting to me personally, but um, then last year I met this guy, Keith McMillan, in San Francisco, who's been working on this bow, which is like, uh, you can use words like state of the art. It's pretty amazing. It's still not ready. There are things that don't quite work, and um, that they will be fixed very, very soon, I'm sure. He's got a team of about 10 people of all varying range of genii. Um, and one of them is Barry, who's going <laughs> to now speak. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. Uh, he's going to so. basically give a bit of background information about this thing, and we're going to try and demonstrate it for you. Okay. okay. Um, hi. Uh, I'm the software director for Keith McMillan Instruments, and here is the Cabo. Tough crowd, huh? No. Um, they, they don't. They don't. I guess we we'll really have to do something here. Yeah, yeah. You you have have that's not enough. Yeah. It's it, and it's you know it's a it's a it's a real violin bow. You can play a real violin with it. Um, and, uh, so you know, not a toy. But um, this came out of our um, musical performance. We have a string trio in Berkeley that we tour with um, called Triometric. And we used to tour around, and we did video and audio with networked uh, data between the instruments. And if you see over right here, we used to carry around this enormous rack of gear. Um, and it got, it got uh, problematic for our, our, our backs. And um, airlines don't like taking that. So What's great now is that we can fit all of the kind of processing and things in one of these. Um, and so we embarked on a kind of quest to make a smaller, more portable performance system um, with, since we're interested in string instruments, um, kind of the most obvious controller you could make for a string instrument, which is the bow. And so here, it's a Bluetooth wireless bow, so just like a keyboard or a set of headphones, connects to the computer and sends a plethora of data um, here where you can control video or the sound of your instrument or robots or, I mean, um, where's the robot? We've actually done it. There's the robot. Um, this thing danced around while we played in time with music. Um, but here, here's kind of a visual aid, which shows the, the, the uh, awesome power you wield with one of these things. And so you, you have, yeah, we're going to connect to this and kind of play some um, demonstrations. So you have several axes on here. I'm going to connect. And it's going to work perfectly the first time. <laughs> it didn't. I, w I wasn't working. Um, so, yeah. So in the middle here, you can see. Let me see if I can make this. Um, um, 
In the middle, there are the accelerometers from the bow. So you can see if he turns it anyway, there's orientation there and also acceleration. So with a, with a uh, move or a jerk, you can see those swing around. Um, on the right is the grip sensor. So there's a little piece um, right here that <coughs> measures the force of the grip of the bow. And oh, there it goes. Great. Um, there's also under here is the bridge sister sensor that goes from the bridge to fingerboard. So it's this axis here gets measured with antennas that are embedded inside the bow. Uh, this is a carbon fiber bow. It has a Kevlar core, um, you know, sturdy thing. Um, and then there is here a um, IR sensor. And that's kind of why I brought up this, because it's hard to see, but anybody can come up after if they want. And those little lights give you the distance. I don't even play violence. You look at me like I just make this thing, right? This way. So you get a measurement. Ah, and I, you're, you're obscured. Enough, enough of this. On the left at the bottom there, there's the length measurement. And then an inclination and tilt. And so right now we have the length um, set up to do a pitch shift on the sound. Uh, and so all of these various data parameters that you can see bouncing around um, can get mapped to any one of the controllers in our software. So right here is just kind of a standard processing bank. You have you know, compressor, EQ, pitch shift, uh, filter, ring modulation, amp simulation. And so right now, if you look at the, the pitch shift right over here, um, as the length goes up and down, you can hear the violin sound being processed. Um, yeah, in a, a musically pleasing way. Um, so there's one really simple example of how a uh, bow parameter can be mapped to something. Um, where, what's next? Now we can map another thing. So going through. So here's another example where the same parameter, the length, is going to control a reverb freeze. Um, and so the reverb tail, he'll, he'll play, and then the reverb tail will be frozen, and you'll hear this chord that's just held with the reverb tail. Um, there we anyway. So there's a, uh, um, this is distortion. We don't um, know that this is a quick thing, by the way. We and check so, not check this. I'm not worried. Okay. Um, here, here's the kind of screen where you set up all your mappings for this thing. So I can pick any number of sources that are either direct from the bow or derived from it, like whether you're doing up bow or down bow or bow speed or motion. And you map these and you can scale them or send them through a table. And then here is every parameter in, for example, this is the modulation screen for this tone processor. And so every one of these parameters are controllable by this list. So in this one, we have a um, gesture recognizer that when there is a gesture, it, it, will, it will recognize it. It will we recognize might, it. We might have to do this once. Let's see.
It did work. I told you I wasn't worried. Um, so you can see all these <laughs> bow parameters that get uh, Just um, that get the the angle of the bow and the x y accelerometer was controlling you know parameters that sculpted our lush feedback um, soundscape there, uh, which hopefully was discernible. Um, so now this one is a ring modulator that's controlled, which is which is which is here, and is controlled by um, both the length which does the ring modulation rate. You'll see the knob move as he goes up and down the bow here. Um, and the grip is going to hold that whatever rate that is. The length is from the the frog. There's an IR sensor here, and then that little thing that was in my horrible video window um, is here. So it's the distance from that to that. It goes that way. Well, we could try. Well, okay. Where was? I mean, later we can. You could also demonstrate how to to set the bow up, where you actually measure this. You get a reading from there, and then you get a reading there, and it, and then it remem re remembers, basically. After that, there were... So now this... Oh, this is... Here's a fun one. Um, this is... The, the general bow motion controls a delay that... Oh, right. Delays. Okay. <laughs> And so, get a picture up of the yeah, there's also a um, four-track looper included, uh, and so here we'll be able to uh, the grip is going to arm a track and start recording, um, and then we can. And so one of the nice things about this is that all of these tracks, um, you can see over here on the left side, if I pick any one of these sounds that we already did, when I move to that track, that setup goes in the tone <coughs> processor. So you could have a different sound for each track. Um, our reverb freeze is up there right now. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the looping. Um, and then... I think lastly yeah. is our, uh, there's a phase vocoder section so you can do traverse through sound files um, with the bow. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So I guess the only other thing that we kind of haven't covered that's in this is the surround sound um, oh. section. So is that nine? That's ten. And so you can see is this this little um, compelling blue dot bounces around the screen and controls your your panning. two years. Um, so that's kind of the whole setup. There's another, you know, here's kind of an overview of everything that in the whole whole system. Um, and you can see we've been controlling via foot switch. You can hook up all your pedals um, to control mixes. Um, you know, there's a whole modulation section for just the presets of everything. And so you can really step through these things in a in a, a robust way in a, as a piece, um, which is really what we're trying to do is create sort of a comprehen comprehensive system so that um, players can both take their pieces and give them to other people and have them replayed. Uh, composers can compose by creating their interactions um, to the software and then we can have some live interpretive performance of electronic musical works, which is something that happens, but too rarely in our advanced culture. So, um, we yes. Can, we, can do, we can do like three or four minutes of questions now, and then at the end, um, either here or in the bar, we can, you can, you know. And we can also put, if anybody wants yeah. to. So, yeah. Frank, so. You do need the software to read out the data. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty useless except to play the violin with without the software. I so, I mean, right worst case person. scenario, you know, you have a bow. Um, and it's still wireless even if you don't have the software. It sends out, we do send out OSC data. Um, it, send, it speaks via Bluetooth. It's a kind of, uh, it's a standard Bluetooth packet, but we just cram the data in it. Um, and 12 bit DAX. And the data comes in at 100 hertz. Uh, there's another research, that's primarily to save battery life. There's another research mode on it that, um, goes up to 800 hertz, which is, you know, that's a lot of data to know what to do with. Um, so past that point, we pack it into both MIDI and do MIDI outputs. Here's our um, up near the top. Well, no, nope. we moved it yet. We put out OSC and MIDI to any device that you think is capable of dealing with this awesome utility that you are in control of. Uh, 
It is, yeah. You can. Um, it's a Markov model gesture recognizer. Um, it works right now on just the accelerometers. We are currently working on some more in axis, you know, <laughs> any number of parameter versions. Uh, this version we have right now, you have to tell it when the, the start of a gesture is. It's not a continual recognizer. So right now we have a trigger that's um, a grip that, let me know, I can just do it. Um, I got it. So if I, oop, where is it? So this is pretty, th this is the kind of most in development part right now, which is if I squeeze the grip, you'll see it's ready to recognize, and if I go, bah, then uh, it tells you there's no data, right? I guess no, that's what, no. or is it not? Um, yeah, there you go. And so if this was up, we would get that thing again, which, I mean, unless you want to hear that. I'm just um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, the gesture, what these gesture analyzers are doing right now is basically, once it says, hey, I've got a gesture, it sends out a trigger. And so in any one of these screens, I can say gesture one. And when that comes in, for example, it's going to turn on my amp simulator, which is where our um, awesome torrent of noise is emanating from. So, does that answer? Yeah, I mean, the question really is, uh, how can you in a way that you can use it 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 this whole MIDI OSC section, I think, does that an kind of answer? Uh, any one of, like I can send all my bow data out to OSC if I wanted to connect to something. But from the gesture, yeah, the, the um, that's version two. Um, but it's, it's trivial, I mean, it's not like it's version two, like it's gonna, you know, be a, be a hard thing to do. But right now we're just sending the raw data out this list. Um, we'll send all of our derived type of things out as well. Um, we have no problem doing that. Our data, you know, I guess it wants to be free or something. Isn't that what information wants? I don't know. I think information wants anything. But um, you go to questions. Yeah. Um, we'll write a first party external for the bow. Um, yeah, you can connect to the, well, there's a couple of ways. We have a standalone version of this guy, and this MIDI out is in it. So you can connect that way and just send it out to whatever. Um, I would say that, yes, the external, for this is all Max, by the way. I think, I don't know, you can probably, I think my, my tell is the uh, menu box. But, um, yeah. Yes, is the short answer. The, the, the external will be, of it. there is an external now, and I believe that um, it will be available. Is there one more question before we move on? Any more? Uh-huh. This is... This is very, I mean, it's an interesting question, but it's very early on in the game. I mean, I, I met Keith last year in San Francisco, and he came over to where I was staying and showed me this thing, which basically, you know, was like like that, the, 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 the front deck of it. And so I, I was interested, having worked with, you know, this kind of uh, the idea of an interactive bow for a long time. And it was clear that this was a, you know, there were a lot of resources going into this. And... Uh, Keith has, has been, he, he made this thing, the, 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 the which, which thing, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this he made 
and he sold 10,000 of these. But he doesn't live in a house that's worth 10,000 of those. He puts the money straight back into doing this. So it's like it's, it's got resources, it's got some really smart people working on it, and he's gotten hold of materials and the whole thing. So it's in, it's in some ways, it's a, it's a classic, almost like a Silicon Valley kind of thing. It could probably only be made in California, something like this, because of the people who are locally and connected to their various <coughs> you know, systems and organizations. It sort of comes together, it can come together there in a way that it can't come together anywhere else. So I'm, I'm my, for me, I, I actually we're just talking about this today, I'm not interested in replicating what I did um, with my stuff. I'm, you know, I actually basically want a damn great bulldozer controlled, you know, thing on the end of my bow which I can go and uh, create mayhem. I'm actually looking at mechanical results which have audio in them. I mean, you make mechanical results which have, you know, a sound component. I'm not so interested. I mean, I, I obviously, it's quite accessible and easy to use samples and all the whole, you know, menagerie of stuff that's available. And it's designed to, to, to work like that. But for me personally, I'm actually looking to, to do something with this that I haven't done before. We have cranked out a new version of this software since yesterday from working together. <laughs> so yes, uh, I would say our turnover rate is pretty high as far as new features. We talk to people all the time. And um, the nice thing about software always is that you can update it without, you know, if you have a bunch of hardware stuff, you can't really do that often. So we keep updating this, and um, it um, adds value to your product. Um, and I guess quickly I'm just going to mention but not go into our other next product that if anybody's interested we can talk about, which is this guy, which is the string port. Um, audio interface, USB 2, but the interesting thing about it is that it takes... Um, a four-channel pickup from either a VG88 box, like on a guitar. So here's, back here is this plug. It's a standard on like rolling gear. Um, and USB 2, it gives you a separate audio channel for each string. Um, so the nice thing about that is that we can do some faster types of analysis than hardware and drive synthesis from the often neglected string instruments of the world. Um, and it's fast, and it's good and it will be ready in a couple months. Um, if anybody's interested more than that, we can there's discuss There's a bar in it. between there's a, sections. There's a bar. After there's there's a bar until 2 in the morning. It's good. So, yeah, I guess that's... You're going to show videos now. Yeah, thanks, okay. Barry. Now we're going to... Oh, you got them there. They're all right there. I'm going to close all of them. Yeah, close this, them. This, uh, this junk. Nobody wants this. Windows everywhere. <coughs> so the next... Okay. That's good. The next, the next bit of uh, this evening's uh, entertainment um, is a blue... Now it's, now it's blue. There we go. Um, it's about, I mean, it, one thing that Stein's been busy with for many, many years is, is, is obviously making sensors that can go in a, a real world situation. And mostly when people think about electronic music or any kind of media, new media, basically it's like probably a room like this. And the gear is there and it sort of makes a sound very close to a speaker and the audience is sitting right there. Well, I've been interested. Um, for some years in, in, in doing, th this is pretty weird screen, um, Barry. Um, huh? Well, it did something pretty strange then. Anyway, um, without me touching it. Um, sorry? No, the bow's, oh, actually, but this one is. My bow's active. I'll turn it off. Anyway, so um, very, some of this, uh, I want to give some examples, mainly in Australia. Um, but the first one I'm going to uh, look at is, uh, comes from 
that very famous Australian town called San Francisco. Um, it's actually Bob Ostertag. And um, I, where the hell is this stuff? Kayak. That's right, kayak. Thank you. <laughs> You've seen it already. So this is a sensor in, it's very close to a bow when you think about it. It's the paddle from kayaking. And Bob, apart from being a new music type musician, is also a, a uh, a very well-known kayak instructor in San Francisco. So we, um, I had an idea to kind of upgrade Handel's uh, water music um, in the 21st century, and this is uh, the result. We did this actually at the, in the port at San Francisco. Oh, shit. The bow switching out has turned out the sound. I knew that was going to go wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the sound is actually coming from a ghetto blaster parked on the bay side. There's a slow crowd gathering from behind where I'm sitting. And the recording of from inside the kayak, we just put a microphone down by his toes and it just recorded to a mini disc, which I added, cheated, I added later to the video. show all the way through all these things but uh, anyway it's kind of a rather damp audio visual experience and uh, the, so the, the accelerometer was on on the paddle let's find something else now talking as about just then an answer to the question about what I wanted to do with this bow well uh, unfortunately there isn't a, a MIDI enabled uh, big digger available on the market as far as I know but this is about as close as I came this is in the middle of an Australian Outback Station, um, there's a digger actually driving, um, performing off to the camera, which comes in later, but the sa with the, this digger has been sampled and the accelerometer is actually on the digger. I wanted the digger actually to, to dig a damn great hole, but unfortunately the, there was a very strong wind blowing and the audience was sitting right downwind and the organizer asked me that he didn't dig a big hole because everybody would have dust in their face and noses. So. 
with some digger music. The projection is right on the side of a sheep uh, shed, as you can see the corrugated iron. There's about a hundred people in the audience and it's about a ten hour drive to the nearest big town. There was also a live video too, but it's just that this, the, this the clip I selected has got this made, it's pre-recorded <coughs> on there. Um, very close to that town, um, or that station rather, is uh, I don't know where this is going to be. Team music. There's a, a very depressed mining town. Most of this is in Western Australia, which is the size of. Um, Germany, France, and the Benelux countries all together, of which there are only two million people live there, and most of those live in one town. So it's an extremely empty place. And um, normally, the activities that go on in Western Australia are people dig very big holes and sell the contents to China. Um, but this one town called Mount Magnet is with where, every, where they shut the big hole that, that feeds China, and everybody's chronically out of work. There's about a quarter Aboriginal population about a quarter white population, about half in between. Um, and uh, this basically was a ball that uh, Jürgen uh, made upstairs. It's like a, a net ball. It's rubber, and we, we cut it in half, basically, and put accelerometers inside it. And it's used in this, in this town hall. I mean, it was very difficult to get anybody, actually, to, to come and do this. I don't know if we've ever tried to ask teenagers to come and play netball. Um, it just gets to now. But it's, you know, like, it's, it's fun. No, it isn't. And, uh, but you'll make groovy kinds of sounds and be very cool. No, it won't. And it's like, so it goes on like this. But eventually, we've got a few people in there, and this is what they did. Uh, the sound, unfortunately, comes from the camera, so it's a bit muddy. I used basically piano sounds because there was a piano, a wrecked piano in the corner, which I don't think is, hasn't been used in the last 10 years, but it's, they seemed happy with it.
most interesting thing about that is that um, all the um, the rhythms and uh, silences, so or not really thought that they're silent, but the non-action is determined by the game. So the music is actually completely structured by the game. I tried something here at time in, in the mid sixties, which was a bad, interactive badminton game, where I made the mistake of thinking that it was okay to have anybody playing, and it would be like a motor that would just keep the thing going. It didn't matter if they're any good, and it wasn't an issue. But I discovered very quickly that in fact the action has got to be the higher, well, put it this way, the higher the level of the physical activity, the better is the musical result, which you'd think should be logical, but anybody who works with interactive stuff knows that, you know, that doesn't, that wouldn't necessarily add up. I mean, if I, if I wave my arm around, I can make sound, but whether it's, it has any kind of um, logical coordinating features is another thing. Anyway, these kids, they, there was no problem. After I'd managed to persuade them to come in and play this game, So that's all Stein stuff in there. That's basically using Lisa as the sample bank and a junction connects that to the accelerometers, which is basically a hacked game with the awful name called the Thrustmaster, which they, I'm glad to say, don't make anymore. But um, it works over a small range, uh, but a big enough range for a, for a field. Of course, once you have a small netball, the next thing you want is something bigger. So. Um, this. Okay, so this is uh, a 2.4 meter ball with the same kind of software um, working, but the results are very different. Also, is running images too. for guessing, of course, is a metaphor for the planet on which we live, uh, undergoing some rough treatment. And um, so that was like three projections on, and, and the other wardens were basically on the other side. It also worked as an installation as well as a, like a live performance. So the ball would just sit there and people would come in. I mean, kids would come in and go completely crazy and start screaming and shouting and pushing the thing around. That's on one level. On other days, I actually saw someone come in and start praying to it which was quite extraordinary. A, a woman, because the, the gallery was sort of empty at that particular moment, she came in and she really started to pray this thing. So the ball is something that we all understand. I mean, inherently, kids play with it and uh, people kick it around at, at, and, and make a lot of money out of doing so. So it's... Um, I'm going to finish with... Uh, oh, I could just show you another kind of result of that. Uh, after the show in Melbourne, we put it out on the street and this the sample is a sample of a fly of which I have quite a good selection if anybody ever needs one <laughs>
last one I'm going to show you is a kite project. This is rock. Here we go. So this, um, again, was actually, this was uh, quite close to where um, the big digger was digging or trying to dig holes in the ground. And uh, this also is it was Stein software and hardware. Um, and this, this accelerometer actually could sort of, we could get re readings from over 100 meters, which was pretty amazing. And here we go. And the whole thing's battery powered. That's the other th issue about this. The PA, there's no power out there. There's no electricity, like, on tap. This place is called Lizard Rock. So the movements of the of the kite, the kite has an accelerometer gaffer taped onto it. It also has a camera. Uh, these are kind of uh, security cameras, uh, 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless cameras, and uh, you'll see later that we, we, we attach all together, we have four cameras up in the sky. There's one. Because they have fisheye lenses, they, they really give the impression that the Earth is a very small place.
This actually is a concert and these are people turning up for it. That went on for most of the afternoon, um, which we're not able to do this time. So um, one interesting thing, those, those cameras, 2.4 gigahertz cameras, I mean, they even though there's a little bit of interference, they actually do work out there because there's nothing else around. You, you can't do anything like this in the center of town with too much interference. So if you think you're going to use that in the next project in the center of Amsterdam, forget it. It's like it's, it don't work. So that's, anyway, my little uh, roundup of uh, stuff in the outback, mostly. And um, now we'll have a little break and then some real live music. Thank you. Okay.